定会靠你，我是不错。So the seeds of dissension were sown among both the black and the white races. How long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, How long? Yes, sir. because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, How long? How not long. long. How long? Too forever on the scaffold, long yes, forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? How long? Not long. long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? Not, not long. long. Not long. Because my eyes have have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, He's trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Yes, He's sifting out the hearts of men before <laughs> his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. Not so. Glory, hallelujah. crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint and that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, as the model for those who are to build the building. And a building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. Now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, 
and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. In your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to enter these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture back in 1871 that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. That hadn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. And I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. And just don't set out to do a good Negro job, but do a good job that anybody could do. Don't set out to be just a good Negro doctor, a good Negro lawyer, a good Negro school teacher, a good Negro preacher, a good Negro barber, a beautician, a, a good Negro skilled laborer. For if you set out to do that, you have already flunked your matriculation exam for entrance into the University of Integration set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. <laughs> if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, Sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metro Metropolitan Opera. And sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth We'll have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. <laughs> if you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley. But be the best little scrub on the side of the rill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are.
we always, we already have some noble examples of black men and black women who demonstrated to us that human nature cannot be cataloged. They in their own lives have walked through long and desolate nights of oppression and yet they've risen up and plunged against cloud-filled nights of affliction, new and blazing stars of inspiration. And so from an old slave cabin of Virginia's hills, Booker T. Washington rose up to be one of America's great leaders. He lit a torch in Alabama, and darkness fled in that setting. Yes, you should know this because it's in your own city from a poverty-stricken area of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Marin Anderson rose up to be the world's greatest contralto so that a Toscanini could say that a voice like this comes only once in a century. And Sibelius of Finland could say, my roof is too low for such a voice from the red hills of Gordon County, Georgia. And the arms of a mother who could neither read nor write, Roland Hayes rose up to be one of the world's great singers and carried his melodious voice into the palaces and mansions of kings and queens. From crippling circumstances, there came a George Washington Carver to carve for himself an imperishable niche in the annals of science. There was a star in the diplomatic sky, and then came Ralph Bunce, the grandson of a slave preacher. And he reached up and grabbed it and allowed it to shine in his life with all of its scintillating beauty. There was a star in the athletic sky, and then came Jackie Robinson in his day and Willie Mays in his day with their powerful bats and their calm spirits. Then came Jesse Owens with his fleet and dashing feet. Then came Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali with their educated fists. All of them came to tell us that we can be somebody and to justify the conviction of the poet, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ but affection dwells in black and white the same. And if I were so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is the standard of the man. Finally, <laughs> and finally in your last blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Don't allow anybody to pull you so low as to make you hate them. Don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your self-respect to the point that you do not struggle for justice. However young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. You have a responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody. And so you must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Now in this struggle for freedom and justice, there are many constructive things that we all can do and that we all must do. And we must not give ourselves to those things which will not solve our problems. You've heard the word nonviolent and you've heard the word violent. I happen to believe in nonviolence. We struggle with this method with young people and adults alike. 
all over the South, and we have won some significant victories, and we've got to struggle with it all over the North because the problems are as serious in the North as they are in the South. But I believe as we struggle with these problems, we've got to struggle with them with a method that can be militant, but at the same time does not destroy life or property. And so our slogan must not be burn, baby, burn. It must be build, baby, build. Yes, our slogan must be learn, baby, learn, so that we can earn, baby, earn. And with a powerful commitment, I believe that we can transform dark yesterdays of injustice into bright tomorrows of justice and humanity. Let us keep going toward the goal of selfhood, toward the realization of the dream of brotherhood, and toward the realization of the dream of understanding goodwill. Let nobody stop us. I close by quoting once more the man that the young lady quoted, that magnificent black bard who has now passed on, Langston Hughes. One day he wrote a poem entitled Mother to Son. And the mother didn't always have her grammar right, but she uttered words of great symbolic profundity. Well, son, I'll tell you, Life for me ain't been no crystal stab, it's had tax in it. Boards torn up, places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you stop now. Don't you sit out on the steps cause you finds this kind of hard, but I'm still going, boy. I'm still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal stair, but we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. is the biggest nigger lover in the United States. Amen. He may think that he can use his Justice Department with Bobby Kennedy at the head of it, and he may think that he can use J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and the Army to force us white people here in St. Augustine and other parts of the nation to mix up with niggers, but if he sends troops in here and puts a bayonet behind every one of us, we still will not mix up with a bunch of black savages.
Dean Lapierre, Mr. Bell, members of the faculty and members of the student body of this great institution of learning, ladies and gentlemen. Now there are several things that uh, one could talk about before such a large, uh, concerned, and enlightened audience. There are so many problems facing our nation and our world that one could just take off anywhere. But today I would like to talk mainly about the race problem since I'll have to rush right out and go to New York to talk about Vietnam tomorrow and I've been talking about it a great deal uh, this week and weeks before that. But I'd like to use as a subject from which to speak this afternoon the other America. And I use this subject because there are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, and culture and education for their minds, and freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, millions of people experience every day the opportunity of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in all of their dimensions. And in this America, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But tragically and unfortunately, there is another America and this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In this America, millions of work-starved men walk the streets daily in search for jobs that do not exist. In this America, millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. In this America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. In a sense, the greatest tragedy of this other America is what it does to little children. Little children in this other America are forced to grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. And as we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. Many people of various backgrounds live in this other America. Uh, America. Some are Mexican-Americans, some are Puerto Ricans, some are Indians, uh, some uh, happen to be from other groups. Millions of them are Appalachian whites. Probably the largest group in this other America in proportion to its size in the population is the American Negro. The American Negro finds himself living in a triple ghetto, a ghetto of race, a ghetto of poverty, a ghetto is to deal with this problem, to deal with this problem of the two Americas. We are seeking to make America one nation, 
indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Now let me say that the struggle for civil rights and the struggle to make these two Americas one America is much more difficult today than it was five or ten years ago. For about a decade or maybe twelve years, we struggled all across the South in glorious struggles to get rid of legal, overt segregation and all of the humiliation that surrounded that system of segregation. In a sense, this was a struggle for decency. We could not go to a lunch counter in so many instances and get a hamburger or a cup of coffee. We could not make use of public accommodations. Public transportation was segregated, and often we had to sit in the back and Within transportation, uh, transportation within cities, we often had to stand over empty seats because sections were reserved for whites only. We did not have the right to vote in so many areas of the South. And the struggle was to deal with these problems. Now certainly they were difficult problems, they were humiliating conditions. And by the thousands, we protested these conditions. And we made it clear that it was ultimately more honorable to accept jail cell experiences than to accept segregation and humiliation. By the thousand students and adults decided to sit in at segregated lunch counters to protest conditions there. And when they were sitting at those lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and seeking to take the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Many things were gained as a result of these years of struggle. In 1964, the Civil Rights Bill came into being after the Birmingham Movement, which did a great deal to subpoena the conscience of a large segment of the nation to appear before the judgment seat of morality on the whole question of civil rights. After the Selma movement in 1965, we were able to get a voting rights bill. Now, all of these things represented strides, but we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good, solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine quality integrated education a reality. And so today we are struggling for something which says we demand genuine equality. It's not merely a struggle against extremist behavior toward Negroes. And I'm convinced that many of the very people who supported us in the struggle in the South are not willing to go all the way now. I came to see this in a very difficult and painful way in Chicago over the last year where I've lived and worked. Some of the people who came quickly to march with us in Selma and Birmingham were active around Chicago. 
And I came to see that so many people who supported morally and even financially what we were doing in Birmingham and Selma were really outraged against the extremist behavior of Bull Connor and Jim Clark toward Negroes rather than believing in genuine equality for Negroes. And I think this is what we've got to see now and this is what makes the struggle much more difficult. And so as a result of all of this, we see many problems existing today that are growing more difficult. It's something that is often overlooked, but Negroes generally live in worse slums today than 20 or 25 years ago. In the North, schools are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court's decision on desegregation was rendered. Economically, the Negro is worth worse off today than he was 15 and 20 years ago. And so the unemployment rate among whites at one time was about the same as the unemployment rate among Negroes. But today the unemployment rate among Negroes is twice that of whites. And the average income of the Negro is today 50% less than whites. And as we look at these problems, we see them growing and developing every day. We see the fact that the Negro economically is facing a depression in his everyday life that is more staggering than the depression of the 30s. The unemployment rate of the nation as a whole is about 4%. Statistics would say from the Labor Department that among Negroes it's about 8.4%. But these are the persons who are in the labor market, who still go to employment agencies to seek jobs, and so they can be calculated. The statistics can be gotten because they are still somehow in the labor market. But there are hundreds of thousands of Negroes who have given up. They've lost hope. They've come to feel that life is a long and desolate corridor for them with no exit sign. And so they no longer go to look for a job. There are those who would estimate that these persons who are called the discouraged persons would be 6 or 7% in the Negro community. And that means that unemployment among Negroes may well be 16%. And among Negro youth in some of our large uh, urban areas, it goes to 30 and 40%. And so you can see what I mean when I say that in the Negro community, that is a major, tragic, and staggering depression that we face in our everyday lives. Now the other thing that we've got to come to see now that many of us didn't see too well during the last 10 years, and that is that racism is still alive in American society and much more widespread than we realize. And we must see racism for what it is. It is a myth of the superior and the inferior race. It is the false and tragic notion that one particular group one particular race is responsible for all of the progress, all of the insight and the total flow of history and the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately inferior. And in the final analysis, racism is evil because its, its ultimate logic is genocide. Hitler was a sick and tragic man who carried racism to its logical conclusion. And he ended up leading a nation to the point of killing about six million Jews. 
And this is the tragedy of racism because its ultimate logic is genocide. If one says that I am not good enough to live next door to him, if one says that I am not good enough to eat at a lunch counter, or to have a good, decent job, or to go to school with him merely because of my race, he is saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. To use a philosophical analogy here, racism is not based on some empirical generalization. It is based rather on an ontological affirmation. It is not the assertion that certain people are behind culturally or otherwise because of environmental conditions. It is the affirmation that the very being of a people is inferior. And this is the great tragedy of it. I say that however unpleasant it is, we must honestly see and admit that racism is still deeply rooted all over America, is still deeply rooted in the North, and is still deeply rooted in the South. Now this leads me to say something about another discussion that we hear a great deal, and that is the so-called white backlash. I would like to honestly say to you that the white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. It's not something that just came into being because shouts of shouts of black power or because Negroes engaged in riots in Watts, for instance. The fact is that the state of California voted a fair housing bill out of existence before anybody shouted black power or before anybody rioted in Watts. It may well be that shouts of black power and riots in Watts and the Harlems and the other areas are the consequences of the white backlash rather than the cause of them. What it is necessary to see is that there has never been a single solid monistic determined commitment on the part of the vast majority of white Americans the whole question of civil rights and on the whole question of racial equality. This is something that truth impels all men of goodwill to admit. It is said on the Statue of Liberty that America is the home of exiles. But it doesn't take us long to realize that America has been the home of its white exiles from Europe. But it has not evinced the same kind of maternal care and concern for its black exiles from Africa. And it is no wonder that in one of his sorrow songs the Negro could sing out, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. What great estrangement, what great sense of rejection caused the people to emerge with such a metaphor as they looked over their lives. What I'm trying to get across is that our nation has constantly taken a positive step forward on the question of racial justice and racial equality. But over and over again at the same time, it made certain backward steps. And this has been the persistence of the so-called white backlash. In 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery. But at the same time, the nation refused to give him land to make that freedom meaningful. And at that same period, America was giving millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest which meant that America was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor that would make it possible to grow and develop, and refused to give that economic floor to its black peasants, so to speak. And this is why Frederick Douglass could say that emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger freedom to the winds and rains of heaven, freedom without roofs to cover their heads. 
He went on to say that it was freedom without bread to eat, freedom without land to cultivate. It was freedom and famine at the same time. But it does not stop there. In 1875, the nation passed a civil rights bill and refused to enforce it. In 1964, the nation passed a weaker civil rights bill. And even to this day, that bill has not been totally enforced in all of its dimensions. The nation heralded a new day of concern for the poor, for the poverty-stricken, for the disadvantaged, and brought into being a poverty bill. But at the same time, it put such little money into the program that it was hardly and still remains hardly a good skirmish against poverty. White politicians in suburb, suburbs talk eloquently against open housing and in the same breath contend that they are not racist. Now all of this and all of these things tell us that America has been backlashing on the whole question of basic constitutional and God-given rights for Negroes and other disadvantaged groups for more than 300 years. So these conditions Persistence of widespread poverty, of slums, and of tragic conditions in schools and other areas of life. All of these things have brought about a great deal of despair and a great deal of desperation, a great deal of disappointment and even bitterness in the Negro communities. Today, all of our cities confront huge problems. All of our cities are potentially powder kegs as a result of the continued existence of these conditions. Many in moments of anger, many in moments of deep bitterness, engage in riots. Let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that non-violence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve, and that in a real sense it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way. Continue to affirm that there is another way. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. 
social justice, and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Now let me go on to say that if we are to deal with all of the problems that I've talked about, and if we are to bring America to the point that we have one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all, there are certain things that we must do. The job ahead must be massive and positive. We must develop massive action programs all over the United States of America in order to deal with the problems that I have mentioned. Now, in order to develop these massive action programs, we've got to get rid of one or two false notions that continue to exist in our society. One is the notion that only time can solve the problem of racial injustice. I'm sure you've heard this idea. It is the notion almost that that is something in the very, the very flow of time that will miraculously cure all evils. And I've heard this over and over again. There are those, and they're often sincere people, who say to Negroes and their allies in the white community, that we should slow up and just be nice and patient and continue to pray and in a hundred and two or two hundred years the problem will work itself out because only time can solve the problem. Well, I think that is an answer to that myth and it is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists in our nation, have often used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words of the bad people and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so we must help time and we must realize that the time is always right to do right. Now there's another notion that gets out. It's around everywhere. It's in the South, it's in the North, it's in California and all over our nation. It's a notion that legislation can't solve the problem. It can't do anything in this area. And those who <coughs> project this argument contend that you've got to change the heart and that you can't change the heart through legislation. Now, I would be the first one to say that there is real need for a lot of heart changing in our country. And uh, I believe in changing the heart. I preach about it. I believe in the need for conversion in many instances and regeneration, to use theological terms. And I would be the first to say that if the race problem in America is to be solved, the white person must treat the Negro right, not merely because the law says it, but because it's natural, because it's right, and because the Negro is his brother. And so I realize that if we are to have a truly integrated society, Men and women will have to rise to the majestic heights of being obedient to the unenforceable. But after saying this, let me say another thing which gives the other side, and that is that although it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, behavior can be regulated. Even though it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, it can restrain the heartless, even though it may be true 
that the law cannot make a man love me, it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it can and it does change the habits of men. And when you begin to change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes will be changed, pretty soon the hearts will be changed. I'm convinced that we still need strong civil rights legislation. And there's a bill before Congress right now to have a national uh, federal open housing bill, a federal law declaring discrimination in housing unconstitutional, and also a bill to make the administration of justice real all over our country. Now, nobody can doubt the need for this. Nobody can doubt the need if he thinks about the fact that since 1963, some 58 Negroes and white civil rights workers have been brutally murdered in the state of Mississippi alone. Not a single person has been convicted for these dastardly crimes. There have been some indictments, but no one has been convicted. So there is a need for the whole question of the administration of justice. There is a need for fair housing laws all over our country. And it is tragic indeed that Congress last year allowed this bill to die. And that bill died in Congress. A bit of democracy died. A bit of our commitment to justice died. And if it happens again in this section, session of Congress, greater degree of our commitment to democratic principles will die. And I can see no d more dangerous trend in our country than the constant developing of predominantly Negro central cities ringed by white suburbs. This is only inviting social disaster. And the only way this problem will be solved is by the nation taking a strong stand and by state governments taking a strong stand against housing segregation and against discrimination in all of these areas. Now there's another thing that I'd like to mention as I talk about the Massive Action Program and time will not permit me to go into specific programmatic action to any great degree. But it must be realized now that the Negro cannot solve the problem by himself. And there again, there are those who always say to Negroes, why don't you do something for yourself? Why don't you lift yourselves by your own bootstrap? And we hear this over and over again. Now certainly, there are many things that we must do for ourselves and that only we can do for ourselves. Certainly we must develop within a sense of dignity and self-respect that nobody else can give us, a sense of manhood, a sense of personhood, a sense of not be a, being ashamed of our heritage, not being ashamed of our color. It was wrong and tragic that the Negro ever allowed himself to be ashamed of the fact that he was black, or ashamed of the fact that his home, ancestral home, was Africa. And so there's a great deal that the Negro can do to develop self-respect. There's a great deal that the Negro must do and can do to amass political and economic power within his own community and by using his own resources. And so we must do certain things for ourselves, but this must not negate the fact and cause the nation to overlook the fact that the Negro cannot solve the problem him himself. A man was on the plane with me some weeks ago and he came and talked with me and he said, uh, the problem, Dr. King, that I see with what you all are doing is that every time I see you and other Negroes, you are protesting and you aren't, you aren't doing anything for yourselves. And he went on to tell me that he was very poor at one time and he was able to make it by doing something for himself. Why don't you teach your people, he said. 
to lift themselves by their own bootstraps. And then he went on to say other groups uh, face disadvantages, the Irish, the Italians, and he went down the line. And I said to him that it does not help the Negro, it only deepens his frustration for unfeeling and sensitive people to say to him that other ethnic groups who migrated or were immigrants to this country less than a hundred years ago or so have gotten beyond him and he came here some 344 years ago. And I went on to remind him that the Negro came to this country involuntarily in chains while others came voluntarily. I went on to remind him that no other racial group has been a slave on American soil. I went on to remind him that the other problem that we have faced over the years is that the society placed a stigma on the, the color of the Negro, on the color of his skin, because he was black. Doors were closed to him that were not closed to other groups. And I'm to say to people, that you ought to lift yourself by your own bootstraps. But it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And the fact is that millions of Negroes, as a result of centuries of denial and neglect, have been left bootless. And they find themselves impoverished aliens in this affluent society. And that is a great deal that the society can and must do if the Negro is to gain the economic security that he needs. Now, one of the answers, it seems to me, is a guaranteed uh, annual income, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. It seems to me... It seems to me that the civil rights movement must now begin to organize for the guaranteed annual income, begin to organize people all over our country and mobilize forces so that we can bring to the attention of our nation this need and this something which I believe will go a long, long way toward dealing with the Negro's economic problem and the economic problem with many other poor people confronting our nation. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about Vietnam, but I can't make a speech without mentioning some of the problems that we face there, because... <laughs> because I think this war has diverted attention from civil rights it has strengthened the forces of reaction in our country and has brought to the forefront the military-industrial complex that even President Eisenhower warned us against at one time. And above all, it is destroying human lives. It's destroying the lives of thousands of the young, promising men of our nation, destroying the lives of little boys and little girls in Vietnam. But one of the greatest things that this war is doing to us in civil rights is that it is allowing the great society to be shot down on the battlefields of Vietnam every day. And I submit this afternoon that we can end poverty in the United States. Our nation has the resources to do it. The national gross product of America will rise to the astounding figure of some $807 this year. We have the resources. The question is whether the nation has the will. And I submit that if we can spend $5 billion a year to fight an ill-considered war in Vietnam and $20 billion to put a man on the moon, our nation can spend billions of dollars even on their own two feet right here on Earth. Let me say another thing that's more in the realm of the spirit, I guess. 
And that is, if we are to go on in the days ahead and make true brotherhood a reality, it is necessary for us to realize more than ever before that the destinies of the Negro and the white man are tied together. Now, there are still a lot of people who don't realize this. The races still don't realize this. But it is a fact now that Negroes and whites are tied together. And we need each other. The Negro needs the white man to save him from his fear. The white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. We are tied together in so many ways, our language, our music, our cultural patterns, our material prosperity, and even our food are an amalgam of black and white. And so there can be no separate black path to power and fulfillment that does not intersect white roots. And there can be no separate white path to power and fulfillment short of social disaster it does not recognize the need of sharing that power with black aspirations for freedom and justice. We must come to see now that integration is not merely a romantic or aesthetic something where you merely add color to a still predominantly white power structure. Integration must be seen also on political terms where there is shared power where black men and white men share power together to build a new and a great nation. In a real sense, we all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. John Donne placed it years ago in graphic terms, no man is an island in private health. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. He goes on toward the end to say any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And so we all in the same situation. The salvation of the Negro will mean the salvation of the white man and the destruction, the life, and of the ongoing progress of the Negro will be the destruction of the ongoing progress of the nation. Now let me say finally that we have difficult days ahead, but I haven't despaired. Somehow I maintain hope in spite of hope, and I've talked about the difficulties and how hard the problems will be as we tackle them. But I want to close by saying this afternoon that I still have faith in the future. And I still believe that these problems can be solved. And so I will not join anyone who will say that we still can't develop a coalition of conscience. I realize and understand the discontent and the agony and the disappointment and even the bitterness of those who feel that whites in America cannot be trusted. And I would be the first to say that there are all too many who are still guided by the racist ethos. But I am still convinced that there are still many white persons of goodwill. And I'm happy to say that I see them every day in the student generation who cherish democratic principles and justice above principle, and who will stick with the cause of justice and the cause of civil rights and the cause of peace throughout the days ahead. And so I refuse to despair. I think we are going to achieve our freedom because however much America strays away from the ideals of justice, the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up in the destiny of America. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. 
before the beautiful words of the Star Spangled Banner were written, we were here. And for more than two centuries, our forebears labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most humiliating and oppressive conditions. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to grow and develop. And I say that if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery couldn't stop us, the opposition that we now face, including the so-called white backlash, will surely fail. We're going to win our freedom because both the sacred head of our nation and the eternal will of the almighty God are embodied in our echoing demand. And so I can still sing, we shall overcome. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. With grace, we will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and live together as brothers and sisters all over this great nation. That will be a great day. That will be a great tomorrow. In the word, sure to speak symbolically, that will be the day when the morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy. Thank you. <laughs>
Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio-equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second-floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. Police said they found a high-powered hunting rifle about a block from the hotel, but it was not immediately identified as the murder weapon. Mayor Henry Loeb has reinstated the dusk-to-dawn curfew he imposed on the city last week when a march led by Dr. King erupted in violence. Governor Buford Ellington has called out 4,000 National Guardsmen. And police report that the murder has touched off sporadic acts of violence in a Negro section of the city. In a nationwide television address, President Johnson expressed the nation's shock. America is shocked and saddened by the brutal slaying tonight of Dr. Martin Luther King. I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. I pray that his family can find comfort in the memory of all he tried to do for the land he loved so well. I have just uh, conveyed the uh, sympathy of Ms. Johnson, myself, to his widow, Mrs. King. I know that every American of goodwill joins me in mourning the death of this outstanding leader and in praying for peace and understanding throughout this land. We can achieve nothing by lawlessness and divisiveness among the American people. It's only by joining together and only by working together can we continue to move toward equality and fulfillment for all of our people. I hope that all Americans tonight will search their hearts as they ponder this most tragic incident. King was born in Atlanta January 15, 1929. He was the son and the grandson of prominent Negro ministers in Atlanta, and he had an extended education. He graduated finally with a doctorate from Boston University in 1954 and got his first pastorate uh, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and it was there he was, or Montgomery, Alabama, it was there he was to win fame, because in December 1955, he took leadership of a bus boycott there, and he, uh, in his policy of nonviolence over the period of a year, won that strike with a federal desegregation order in Alabama. His nonviolent campaign spread through the South, and he became the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a conference primarily of Negro ministers. Since the rise of radical Negroes such as Stokely Carmichael and Rap Brown, uh, King had been considered uh, a voice of moderation, and uh, white leaders had looked to his policy of nonviolence as a hopeful antidote to those who preached riot and hatred. King was married and had two children, a daughter Yolanda and a son Martin Luther III. His wife was notified in Atlanta tonight, told only that he had been shot in the shoulder to spare her uh, any further concern and alarm as she flew back to uh, Memphis. She, uh, whether she has arrived there or not, we have not been advised. We have just been advised, however, that Governor Buford Ellington has ordered 4,000 National Guard troops into the city. A curfew has been clamped on Memphis.